My brother used to say that he had found it a good rule in life to avoid anything described in advance as an intellectual treat. You can relax. This will be nothing of that sort. I just plan to take you along and let you look over my shoulder while I paint. Any information imparted will be negligible. Today there are as many kinds of art as there are artists. All are good if you happen to like them. That is, they are good for you. That's the only criterion today. Perhaps there never was any other. So avoid dogmatic judgments like the one I once saw in Macy's elevator. It read, visit our art department. If it does not please you, visit our optical department. What kind of an artist am I? Certainly no modernist, because I have always been deeply interested in modern subject matter. They have seldom paid much attention to it. Today, any recognizable subject is out of fashion. When I was a young man, the modernist painted mostly still life, but with a new approach, using familiar objects, but changing their shapes and colors to produce interesting patterns and designs. Of that manner, I particularly admire the work of Braque. The traditional painters of that same era had their eyes turned too much backward on the past. Accent was on the classic. I never belonged wholly in either camp. I call myself a contemporary painter, belonging to that group who find subject matter wherever they may be. In New York, I painted skyscrapers, suspension bridges, and steel steamers at the docks. In Pittsburgh, I painted steel mills and a series of railroad engines. During World War I, I painted what the pilots said were the first oil sketches actually completed during flight. History is here and now. Why look at it in retrospect? Obviously, I have painted many subjects that you consider ugly, so you jump to the conclusion that the pictures must be ugly. You wonder why I show you things you've made up your mind to dislike. Well, I suppose it's just my incurable missionary urge to convert you to my own beliefs. Workers in creative fields have often felt this as an obligation laid upon them. In that much quoted preface to the nigger of the Narcissus, Joseph Conrad said, my task is by the power of the written word to make you hear. It is above all to make you see. If the painter is not to be merely an entertainer, it is our task by the power of the painted image to make you see. Throughout all history, artists have spent more time than their fellows in intensive looking and they have gradually widened man's perception of the appearance of things. I could cite two instances during my own lifetime when new discoveries by the artists were first stubbornly resisted, but later accepted by the public. If you have come from the oculist and he assured you that you had 20-20 eyesight, you probably think you have excellent vision. I doubt it very much. What you have is the undeveloped capacity for it. You're a specialist and have looked closely at a few things in which you are deeply interested, but outside of those you have looked at a multitude of things without anything but the most superficial perception. <coughs> Originally, I planned this talk as a Mediterranean sketching trip, but I wound up by taking you to many other places. I have always loved painting New York City, and sometimes on boarding a steamer for points east, I have wondered why I left Manhattan at all. I am so sure that the attraction of foreign climes is largely novelty, that before taking you up the gangplank, I propose to show you a small group of rather special New York night scenes, which demanded of me a different mode of life and a special technical approach. I had painted so many New York subjects that at one time a one-man show of mine, composed entirely of them, traveled to a number of cities, but there was not a single night scene in the group. I had realized that they could not be done properly from a 67th Street studio. It was necessary to live close to the material and absorb the spirit of the neighborhood. So, after I had left New York to live in Connecticut, I sneaked back to Manhattan and buried myself on the waterfront. I spent my nights roaming the streets and docks with a sketch box and a small flashlight pinned to my coat. I had a number of failures before learning what night flyers on a carrier learned long ago, that to see well in the dark you must not be exposed to a bright light in the ready room. In order to see my subject, I too had to learn to work under such a feeble light that it was impossible to tell the difference between dark red, dark blue, and dark green. The eventual solution was simple. It was like playing the piano in the dark. 
I had to know the exact position of each color or mixed modification of it, and I arranged on my palette in daylight the expected gamut of color. Before I say more, let's have the lights out and be ready to show slides. I have found that folks do not dislike night pictures if they do not look like night. Early evening or bright Broadway illumination are both okay, but show them the mystery of the nocturnal waterfront and they shy off. This was painted entirely with a weak flashlight. When I had moonlight, I depended upon it. I managed to get a fairly truthful rendition of the sketch in this slide, but I am showing you only four of several dozen that I made because light reflected from the ridges of paint made them too difficult to photograph. This one I call the middle watch, and for the benefit of those who may not own yachts, I will say that it's the nice quiet four-hour period, beginning at midnight, during which most of my sketches were made. Eventually, I made a large picture from this one and another large canvas from the next sketch, which I call Rising Moon. Painting the Brooklyn Bridge has been an obsession with me. Long ago, I lost count of the number of times I painted it in daylight or dark. What became of those two big nocturnes? After being exhibited, both were painted out, not just because night has no popular appeal, but because I felt they did not measure up to the standards which large pictures demand. You see, I am letting you look over my shoulder both when I am painting and when I am painting out. I doubt if the public realizes how many pictures most artists paint out. It's a useful practice which raises average in those remaining. There must be some mistakes in judgment, of course. What about posterity? Don't give it a thought. As Mr. Dooley said, what has posterity ever done for us? This color slide was made with a very special process which does more than justice to the sketch. It enhances it. Through my articles on picture gallery lighting, I became acquainted with a man in General Electric's Neela Lamp Works in Cleveland, and we had a rewarding correspondence on the best method of avoiding the objectionable reflections on dark pictures, which make photography difficult and which spoil the viewer's enjoyment in museums, where it is aggravated by the standard practice of hanging works too high on the wall. Your Polaroid driving glasses are effective in removing much of highway glare because reflected light is partly polarized. My friend asked me to send this sketch out to him to see what he could do. He placed a Polaroid filter over the camera lens, a very common practice, and in addition he placed similar filters over both of the light sources. The original sketch for rain was larger than my usual size, but the ultimate big picture here shown was not painted till years later in Pittsburgh. However, I always continued to think about it, and whenever in New York I found time to go down to the waterfront and stand and study it, looking up at what Béranger called Le Grenier ou ma jeunesse de la misère a subi ses leçons. That little light up under the mansard roof was mine. When I finally painted the picture, I put a great deal into it, and I think it the culmination of a very rich experience during two separate sojourns on the waterfront. As I wrote to a friend, rain is not just one of my pictures, it is a page out of my life. As you see, night is still with us. I am still trying to convert you to a taste for it, but we have traveled several thousand miles to Casablanca, where I could not resist making a sketch of our ship at the dock. The previous sketch was painted a year ago, but this one dates from my first visit to Morocco, when you approached Tangier on a small coasting vessel and stepped ashore on the beach from a rowboat. I had been warned that Arabs objected with possible violence to being painted, but I barged up to the Casbah and was not bothered at all. Sorry not to show you a color slide, but the original watercolor has long been out in Louisville, Kentucky. This is Alexandria, I suppose you still think of it as Egypt, but that word is taboo there. You must always say United Arab Republic. Outdoor sketching there would be impossible, even armed with the Arab word imshe, meaning scram. I will admit that it is shocking to visit Greece and have nothing to show for it but a view of the port of arrival and departure. It is like the parable of the man picking up a crooked stick upon leaving the forest. When we visited the Parthenon, a howling gale almost blew us off the Acropolis. But even under favorable conditions, why paint the Parthenon? 
Whistler asked and answered that question when he said, why paint the Doge's palace? That is a work of art already. Throughout the centuries, the artist has been increasing your clear perception of the actual appearance of the world. Apart from this basic service, he has performed the useful function of pointing out that some things you overlook are beautiful in his opinion. The word opinion is essential to that statement. Beauty is not inherent in anything. It's just an attribute we bestow on things we happen to like. However, as a sort of expert in aesthetics, the artist could be helpful in directing attention and perhaps in widening your range of enjoyment. Browning wisely wrote in Pippa Passes, we are made so that we love, first when we see them painted, things we have passed perhaps a hundred times nor cared to see. I have now taken you to Portofino, a small fishing village on the Italian Riviera, sufficiently picturesque to have been used as a setting for motion pictures. It is a view from my hotel window. And this is another view of the same buildings which form one side of the quaint landlocked harbor. You may recognize these arches from a Humphrey Bogart Eva Gardner movie, which I believe was called The Barefoot Contessa. Actually, these buildings are fishermen's houses, and the arches are bare, as you see them here. But for the movies, they were turned into a bazaar with embroideries and fancy basket work on display. We are still in Portofino, looking down from the church. Perhaps at the far end of the harbor, you can make out those hand-tailored trees and the outdoor tables of the Hotel Nazionale. Now we have come down the hill to the Hotel Nazionale Café, and I made this in the next quick sketch at the café table after studying both views during a leisurely lunch. I am often asked, how should I start a sketch? The best advice I ever had came not from an artist or a teacher, but from a famous detective, William Pinkerton. He said, when I am baffled, I just go to the scene, sit down, and let the place talk to me. Can you think of any better advice to give a painter? Too many want to impose their own ideas on nature. Sketching should be research. This one is also from the Café Nazionale, but is looking toward the left. Here is the west side of Portofino Harbor, during a gale outside, which even in that landlocked harbor can raise some rather rough water. Now we have moved to a nearby town, Santa Margarita, and this is San Giacomo Church. It is a few miles east of Portofino. Notice the way they keep the trees working for them, just as they would cows or chickens. New sprouts are constantly clipped off and woven into wattled windbreaks to ward off the cold Apennine winds from grapevines. This is in, again in Santa Margarita, and this is the marketplace. And now that San Giacomo Church is out of sight, I want to test the keenness and accuracy of your observation. Was the white church lighter than the gray sky? Settle it among yourselves. I'm going on to Venice, which I've visited three times and think the most wonderful place in Italy. Here we are in Venice on the Riva degli Schiavone, and the church is Santa Maria della Pietà. Vivaldi, whose music is currently in fashion, was associated with that church. Arbe was my first island stop when I started down the east coast of the Adriatic. We usually call it Dalmatia, but the Italians had a prettier name for it, Adria. Here I made the acquaintance of a young Austrian, the music critic on the Wiener Journal, and he posted me on local customs and on the extraordinary emphasis on what the Germans call Stand. Any profession, or even humble calling, was part of your name. I was not addressed as Herr Warner, but Herr Kunstmaler Warner. It was customary and courteous to raise the rating in a small cafe with only one waiter, it was imprudent to clap hands and sing out, Kellner, far better service if you said, Herr Ober, meaning Mr. Head Waiter. Being both of the younger generation, we were inclined to spoof the whole business and called each other the Herr Ober Kunstmaler and the Herr Ober Musikalischer Kritiker. Protocol reached its most absurd heights in posted signs, which were usually in German or Italian, though restaurant menus were in parallel columns and in Croatian and Italian. I asked my friend what the letters PT meant on all signs and learned that they stood for Pieno Titolo, whatever your title may be. If a graph or a prince were to read a sign without them, he would be grossly insulted. Later, I realized this title business was more important 
than I had imagined. Lesina was the island where my longest stay was made. I had just arrived and was waiting for the midday meal when a distinguished looking gentleman approached with outstretched hand and introduced himself as the president de la Societa per il Abalimento de la Città de Lesina. He was Mr. Big of Turismo, though that word had not yet been invented. His particular task was embellishing Lesina and dusting off her welcome mat. Later, he introduced me to some young men. We played billiards, went swimming, and on a tennis court, which Mr. Big had just built, I played with lads and lasses of my own age, a very luxurious game with red balls and caddies to pick them up and place them in a stand at the service line convenient to your left hand. The Mandracchio was a small enclosed basin within the harbor. Don't get the idea that I was just a playboy. I was working very hard. One day upon returning to the courthouse, the Frau Wirtin met me in great excitement to tell me that the Bezirksamt was paying an official call on me. I was duly impressed when I was informed that he was more than the mayor, he was the head man of the whole area. He said nice things about my paintings when I showed them to him. I expressed admiration for the beauty of his island paradise, and we parted in a spirit of mutual esteem and mutual kite. Small wonder that I began to think it was necessary to leave home in order to be appreciated at your true worth. However, a day of reckoning was at hand. One morning, walking through the back hall, I glanced up at the guest list, which must be posted by law. There I saw my name, Sir Everett Warner Kunstmaler. What would you have done with knighthood thrust upon you? Become an impostor in spite of yourself? Probably just what I did. Decided to do nothing hasty. I was leaving soon for this island, Sebenico, and I concluded that if knighthood were in flower, it best be kept blooming till I got away. It would be most embarrassing for the Bezirksamt to discover that he had paid an official call on a mere artist painter. Could I expose to ridicule the Frau Wirtin, whose confused knowledge of English had caused this situation? If a letter could be addressed, Mr. Everett Warner, dear sir, why was I not Sir Everett? How about that gal who had often been my partner at tennis? I can't now recall her face, but I still remember her name because it sounded like sleigh bells, Giovannina Schiatina. Could I shatter her illusions? Perish that thought. Admiral Straws once said, in avoiding a decision, you are making one but it seemed the most considered course for all concerned. Here we are in Villefranche on the French Riviera, and it is the spring of 1962, and far away both in distance and in time from those early Adriatic days. Now for an inland excursion to saint chartier and the Chateau de la Clay, where we lived one winter when our son James was at the air base of Chateau Roux. In December, as you see, the grounds were attractive. But in winter, we found unheated halls and stairways mighty cold. They had the bitter chill of St. Agnes' Eve every night of the week. To paint this spiral stairway, I had to bundle up, well, even more warmly than if I'd planned to go outdoors. Can you see faint indications of a mysterious figure starting down the stair from the empty rooms above, where it must have been too cold for even a disembodied spirit to wait until midnight? Someday I may develop this into a larger picture and call it the ghost of the Chateau de la Clay. This is saint chartier Castle in the same town, an outwardly pretentious castle occupied by soi-disant nobility. My Dalmatian experience, you see, made me suspicious of all titles. We were glad they never paid a courtesy call on Sir Everett and Lady Catherine. It would have been embarrassing to receive them. True, the empty salon with moth and dropping arras hung stamped us with the cachet of decayed gentry, the genuine impoverished aristocracy. But what about that pile of coal we had dumped on the floor to save it from theft in the cellar? The final weeks of our second winter visit to France were spent in Collioure, on that part of the French Riviera called the Côte Rouge. This is the old Knight Templar fortress. Few Americans ever visit the town, but it is an old art colony for the French, and Picasso and Juan Gris met there and became friends. I call this Mediterranean rope patterns, and I hope you take it seriously because it is a carefully planned structural design. A sketch may be, a, may be casual research, but a serious picture should have a life of its own apart from its subject matter. It does not show in the slide, but some of the areas are in metallic paint and from certain positions the rope turns to silver. It is time now to turn homeward, and some 
poor sailors may prefer to return by air, and I confess this will be a long detour. I have never flown or sketched an Atlantic crossing, so I show you the Pacific with its characteristic cloud cover. This is en route from Makalapa Airfield in Honolulu to Midway. Above the clouds, the sky has that clear, clean-washed appearance not elsewhere found. Here is another sketch from the same PBM, a view of the Sunlight Sea. Now let's go back in history, quite a few years, to the First World War. This is the James River and is one of a series which the pilots said were the first paintings actually completed during f flight. I had to crouch down in the open cockpit and keep my paint box low out of the airstream or it would have been carried right out of my hand. In those days there was no intercom with the pilot or his passenger amidships. After the landing, the pilot asked me how it went. Okay, I said, it was difficult over the James River on account of the bumpy air. Huh, the air wasn't bumpy, said the pilot. I let that second-class cook take over the controls. This is between the Virginia Capes, another of the same series. After Norfolk, I went up to the Navy base at Far Rockaway and did a number of sketches over New York. And this is Manhattan from a seaplane. From a six by nine flight sketch, I made a larger pastel and then this oil painting from which the slide was made. And eventually, a large 40 by 45 picture. I also painted a large picture of an air view over the battery, which was shown in one of the Corcoran's contemporary exhibitions. I had wangled the all ships and stations authorization from Assistant Secretary of the Navy Roosevelt on the plea that it would be good for Navy publicity. I had ambitious and novel plans for an exhibition of aerials. They were not to be hung on the gallery walls, but spread in a row on the floor and viewed as aerials should be. Few people had flown in those days, and since there was little interest in my project, both the large pictures went the way of all canvas they were painted out. Before taking you out of planes, I want to take you on a few uh, Caribbean flights, and this is St. George, Grenada. You see, I still stick to the pronunciation used in the islands. In President Kennedy's speech on Cuba, he said Caribe in one place and Carib in another. Was this inadvertence or a smart politician's device for pleasing both sides in a controversy? This view is from our hotel window and is of the, what they call the Carinage in St. George. Again, from our hotel window, this is a sunrise. It is true that in the tropics, the dawn comes up like thunder. That is, the sun comes up with a rush the moment it peeps over the horizon. But the belief that there is no twilight is contrary to my observation. This is Barbados and the Carinage. In my own opinion, Barbados, of all the Antilles, offers the greatest variety in accommodation and in kinds of recreation. They have had long experience. George Washington was an early American tourist more than 200 years ago. After taking a look at this Barbados gateway, we will fly down to Trinidad, the most southerly of the Windward Islands, and from there it is but a half hour flight to Tobago. Tobago is a charming little island which Daniel Defoe used as a setting for Robinson Crusoe, though he had never visited it. On this palm-shaded beach, the barkeeper had adjusted his conscience to a double life. Weekdays he served coconut milk laced with rum on the beach. Sundays he preached in a Negro church. Here a quick impression of a difficult and fleeting effect on one of the grenadines called Bequa. No telephones, no taxis, no electricity, no TV, no mainland communication. A small motor launch carries mail occasionally to the island of St. Vincent, sometimes a rough and wet passage. The only occupation of the natives on Bequa is fishing. They scrape the barnacles off their boats by careening them on the beach, just as the pirates of the Spanish Main did. It's the only place I was ever able to thumb a ride on an airplane. I notified St. Vincent that I wanted a seat on the Grumman eight-passenger seaplane. I was rowed out into St. Margaret's Bay, waved the plane down, was hauled aboard, and bound for Trinidad with none of the needless customs and clearances which the islands love to inflict upon each other. It is time to stop island hopping and land on my favorite section of the East River waterfront in New York. While in Pittsburgh, I sent this painting to an exhibit in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and it was caught in the second Johnstown flood. The art gallery was under 10 feet of water for several days, 
but was not swept away, and in time the picture was returned, a sad mess, the frame fallen apart, and painting covered with a quarter of an inch of mud. Had it been on canvas, it would have been a total loss, but it was on a compressed fiber panel, and after careful cleaning, it was as good as ever. This is Desbrasse Street on the Hudson side of the Manhattan, a part of New York. I have painted much less, but in the same area, looking toward the Woolworth building, is this small sketch. It is one of several that I made for the large picture in the collection of the New York Historical S Society. One can do a small one, like this, standing in the shelter of a doorway, even in a snowstorm, but a five-foot canvas would be impossible on West Street. One must use small sketches with occasional revisits to refresh memory. This small sketch, painted at street level from the south side of Peck Slip, put me on the trail of makeshift studio quarters where I was able to paint large pictures from an upper window and leave my canvas and easel till my return visit. At that time, most of the buildings were only partially occupied, a fish house on the ground floor and above it entirely empty floors called lofts in New York City. A kindly fish dealer told me to help myself. I was surprised when I counted up the number of large paintings I did there. In the way of recognition, it was the most rewarding period of my life. The first one, done in a blinding blizzard, went to the International Exposition in Buenos Aires, and after receiving a silver medal, was purchased by some person unknown to me. A rainy day effect went to a Cincinnati collector from my exhibit in the art museum there. Number three is now owned by the Toledo Art Museum, and number four is in the Museum of Charleston, South Carolina. The fifth and largest of the series was the only one painted after I came to live in the neighborhood. It's now in the collection of the New York Historical Society. All passed out of my possession before color slides became common, and this small sketch shows what Peck Slip looked like at an earlier day. This is New York Harbor with one of those rapidly changing effects which has to be quickly recorded. Now Fulton Ferry in snow, taken from my attic window looking down on the ferry which, was Walt, which Walt Whitman has preserved in memory in his poetry. The municipal building in New York under construction. I have often been uncertain about the chronology of my pictures, but never the date of this one because of the story that went the rounds. Two workmen were looking at the cornerstone. Said Mike, what do them letters mean? M-C-M-I-X, replied Pat. What's the name of the Irish contractor, McMix? Now for another aspect of my work, an excursion into the field of pattern. Not discarding reality, just keeping it in its proper place the use of familiar things with an emphasis on, emphasis on design. On my way to the studio one day, the wreck of a bushel basket caught my eye and so intrigued me that I made a sketch of it. A year later, I decided to develop the idea. I made some of the splines red and some yellow. The result seemed to lack punch, so that black ectoplasm was permitted to ooze into the background. If you discover what it means, let me know. I think it helps. I have for it several excellent titles, if I could only keep my face straight. A musician suggested Death and Transfiguration of a Bushel Basket. But my favorite I found in the late William Faulkner's Intruder in the Dust, the ordered chaos of our intricate and shadowy world. The Etruscan Warrior. No, that's not an ideal picture for a sick room. I think it would be fine in the rumpus room or over a private bar. It was inspired by a bronze statue of an Etruscan warrior in the Metropolitan Museum. At one time, I became interested in the decorative possibilities of cuneiform characters, and I painted two pictures. Leonard Bernstein once said of music, it does not have to mean anything, it just is. This picture is in that same category. Much of modern art is intended to arouse in you sensations which have no counterpart in words. It's a legitimate aspect of art, but not the only form of painting, in my opinion. It's much easier to produce an interesting design if you are not at the same time attempting to present some aspect of reality. Stravinsky's Rite of Spring is one of a group of musical abstractions which I did many years ago. Picasso has said there is no such thing as a pure abstraction. You must start with something. There was almost nothing in this case only vague suggestions of visual form derived from musical sounds. 
It sounded brassy to me, so I chose yellow as a dominant color, and the spirals uncoiling upwards were suggested by the music. I quickly concluded that my picture would be looked at, not played. It must succeed or fail in the visual field. So I wound up by making it just as interesting a design as I could. The final result was rather like the oyster soup of which a customer complained that the single bivalve in it failed to give it even a taste of oyster. Said the waiter, that oyster, sir, was put into soup not to flavor it, but to christen it. The best analysis of musical abstractions came in a letter from Roger Sessions after my son Stephen had sent him a photo of a painting which I had christened with the title of one of his works. He wrote, I can hardly hope fully to understand the painting, but I am delighted that one of my compositions has been chosen as a point of departure. Here I chose for my point of departure Billy Bartok's Sot Sonata for two pianos and percussion. My primary impression of this music was sharp edges. I told someone that I would hate to walk around in the piece in my bare feet. In his chorus number 10, Villa Lobos portrayed the spirit of a Brazilian jungle, the confused antiphony of animal sounds and the distant beat of native war drums. I insist that I have faithfully translated this musical imagery into paint. Some skeptics ins insinuate that I have never been to Brazil. The tropical vegetation is nothing but my own bean vines afflicted with a fungus malady, and that the beast is not a genuine Brazilian cougar, but just our black house cat. Pay no attention to these detractors. This is extrapolate expressionism and is as authentic as the canons of that art form require. Some years ago, the Monadnock Art Group constructed in the Keene Square this creche, complete with holy family, manger, and animals. I was intrigued by the curious contrast between the painted Peace on Earth banner and the soldier monument surrounded by ancient cannon and pyramids of old cannonballs. When the picture was apparently finished, I thought it looked empty, and I proceeded to enrich it with gold leaf and silver work after the fashion of a Limoges enamel by Nardon Penico. If it were all right for Giotto to put angels in his skies, I thought I might do it. So, in a sky already sown with silver stars, I introduced a couple of angels and a star of Bethlehem for good measure. Many people have disliked this picture. Please feel entirely free to join them. They charge that angels so close to the Keen City Hall are inappropriate. Why did they accept Giotto's angels in Florentine skies? They couldn't have read Machiavelli. Now, to rest your eyes, we will shift to something you are more likely to like. Almost as many people have liked this as disliked the church. At the Ogunquit, Maine, summer show, visitors voted it the popular prize for landscape. Long ago, swept away by one of our periodic floods, this used to be the ferryman's home on the New Hampshire side of the Connecticut River. Please note the disused ferry boat beached on the bank. I had worked for a good many days on the Vermont side of the Connecticut River and I worked rather late on the last day in order to finish this large picture. Quickly I shoved the painting in front of the rear seat of the Model T and hurried to catch the ferry. I missed it by ten minutes and saw no ferry boat on the New Hampshire side. It had gone down in deep water close to the shore. Some passengers managed to swim ashore, but the cars and four bodies were not recovered till the following day. One of several canvases I made during a very cold winter spent in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. Now this is one of several sketches that I made preliminary to the winter picture in the Chicago Art Institute collection. It was on a very large, heavy canvas, impossible to carry back and forth the two miles in a high wind. So I left it out there, leaned against a rock and covered with oilcloth and partly concealed with brush. Whenever I read of another picture stolen from the Phillips Gallery, it is a great comfort to me to know that I paint the kind of pictures that are safe anywhere. I finished the picture in a heavy snowfall which piled up on my palette and clogged my brushes, and while I was struggling home with the canvas, so much snow accumulated on the wet painted surface that was hours before the melting snow revealed the final result. By contrast, this was the balmiest kind of a spring day, with still patches of lingering snow. Now back to real winter from a window of our house. Yes, it was more comfortable, but still the room must be kept cold. Why? In a warm room, the windows may fog up or frost over and obscure your view. 
This is much the same view, but from our dooryard on a comfortable autumn day. I have always been fascinated with water flowing under bridges. On one unforgettable occasion, I established ideal conditions for painting covered bridges. My son Stephen drove me to Vermont and left me in his travel trailer, which you see here. I am at work the first day. It was wonderful. No interruptions, no phone calls, and above all, no regular meal hours. I knew there was a spring hard by, and I had planned one of these survival programs, living on spring water, roots, and berries, with an assist in peanut butter and crackers, and perhaps a few cans of soup for special occasions. Not one minute of the long summer daylight was to be wasted on cooking or eating. My chosen austerity program was frustrated on one occasion. My wife declared Vermont a disaster area and drove 80 miles to bring a hot covered dish of stew to the supposedly starving. This is the view I was painting when my son left me after snapping the previous slide. Now this is the south end of the same bridge with Mount Ascutney in the distance. I always feel that a bridge painted without water is like a fish without water. This now is the largest and the most serious of all the paintings I made of the Dingman Bridge. I wanted to emphasize water lying flat and passing under the bridge, the distant shoreline to appear farther away than the bridge span itself. It's the continuing battle to create existence in space. This was viewed from a hill on the northern side, and close to where I was standing was an another bridge, this one on the north fork of the Black River. All three bridges of this Vermont area are succumbing to the march of progress, being flooded for a power project, camouflage as flood control. The Heartland Vermont Bridge here, and that little board on the end of the bridge is an ancient sign saying, two dollars fine for driving faster than a walk. This is another bridge, one near Bellows Falls over the Saxons River, at a very nice time of year. Now, with weather getting colder, this is the frozen Connecticut River. It's the sort of picture that people dislike because it makes them feel cold. Perhaps that's real communication. I communicate my own chill when I was painting it. The winter temperature here is as low or lower, but people seem to like this one for that limpid clarity of air when the air is so dry that you're scarcely aware of the cold. This large picture is a sort of family heirloom because it was painted from our upper window. The car is our 41 Ford, and Sun Jim posed for all of the figures, including the girls. An artist friend, Billy Foote, once asked me if I remembered Lawton Parker's Paris Salon picture with three nude nymphs dancing on the beach. He added, I posed for all three of them. The house across the way was closed for the winter, and I needed a line for my composition as well as a path for the skiers. So I had to get a shovel and clear a path to the door of the vacant house. Perhaps you thought landscape painting was all light, easy work. We might warm up a little by taking now a look at this maple on the wall. It's just a view very close to my own studio. Again, I keep slipping in a nocturne trying to wear you down. It's the same church but bowing to popular will, there are no angels this time. Before the hurricane of 39 brought it down, this sentinel elm was a conspicuous landmark from distant Vermont points across the river. Next, I'm going to show you the town hall curtain which I painted for my hometown of Westmoreland, New Hampshire. I decided that no pompous art critic would ever see it or write about it, and it would never be seen on Madison Avenue or 57th Street. Therefore, I aimed it directly at Route 63, which here winds up the hill. For point of view, I chose to hover several hundred feet above the village. I had never seen it from the air, but neither had my audience, which was very convenient, since it allowed me to shift some things around to better the composition. My experience in aerial sketching enabled me to create a very plausible aerial view. I could change some fundamentally important things without challenge, but I had to be authentic in small details. Thus, in recognizing familiar things, the viewers would have the joy of audience participation. This simple little landscape can speak for itself, but
but I want to comment on the next one because I think it has beautiful sweeping lines for which I can claim not one iota of credit except beyond the intelligence to choose the subject. Perhaps it is a lack of capacity on my part, but I've never been able to sit down in the studio and invent lines and patterns as beautiful as those I find in nature. I agree with the person who said, truth is not only stranger than fiction, it is also more beautiful. This is the sort of day when spring's foot half falters. Now, for a country garden, personally I like these haphazard New England gardens better than the formal rigid ones of Europe. This is over the wall, the walls right behind my Westmoreland studio, and it's the last thing I did before closing the studio for the winter. Now, for my favorite pasture on the Connecticut River, and in a couple of minutes I will show you a still larger canvas of this same subject. I call this delaying spring because the land scarcely reveals the promise of later performance. I find stone walls a severe test of artistic integrity. No two stones are alike, and if you believe in, if you believe in searching for character, you start out making them different. Soon you're weary of well-doing, and the wall begins to look like a pile of watermelons. Leon Kroll told me that when he was a student painting on the main coast, he boldly took some of his work to Winslow Homer for a criticism. After looking them over, the great man said, Paint the figure, me boy. Save the rocks for your old age. They're easy. I doubt if it is visible on the slide, but this is one of several pictures where I introduced those after images which you see after looking at the setting sun. The images near the sun will be purple circles with a green border, and images more distant from the sun suffer a second reversal and are green spots with purple borders. If you have never seen this, you should start looking. Don't try to confirm it with a color slide because it is a phenomena of optical fatigue. If you think I'm just crazy, I will take refuge in the story of Bob, well, I will not give his last name to protect the innocent, as Jack Webb would say. He was an artist who painted some very good decorative screens, but who had too much money for his own good and was getting rid of it so fast that his family had him committed to Matawan. The doctors there soon decided that he was not really crazy. He had not tried to curb inflation by raising the postal rates or tax the people to put one of them on the moon. So they gave him a discharge from Matawan. Return home. In some argument, a friend thoughtlessly said, Why, Bob, you're crazy. Bob put the discharge out of his pocket and said, I'm not crazy, and I can prove it, and that's more than you can do. Here we are back in my favorite pasture, where I painted three large pictures and several sketches. This maple tree is an individualist and obstinately holds its leaves after all the other maples are bare. I made one picture of it in its yellow dress when the snow was on the ground. Here are some more maples, but these trees follow the dictates of fashion. Though the leaves are not really worn out, they discard them promptly and haven't a single thing to wear, not till next spring. In this, I used a rather stylized form of realism on a background of metallic paint. And when you shift from the front view to the side, the ferns turn to brilliant silver. You never saw such an effect in nature, but as Whistler said, don't you wish you could? Realism not only means different things to different artists, but on occasion has diverse meanings for the same artist. Nature and life are the raw material out of which art is fashioned. A devoted admirer of the authentic, I never dared tell my students that if their work is preserved for future generations, it will be valued for the personal way in which they deviated from nature. That deviation is what we call style. Here is one of two paintings that I did were at, that were at variance with my usual manner. I want to have another go at it. I have a standard answer for those who come to my studio and say, which do you think is your best picture? I say, the next one, the one I haven't painted yet. The great mistake of beginners is that they think that snow is just white paint out of a tube. True, Vlamink made a big commercial success out of that mistake. If a lush summer subject looks cool and attractive, I keep thinking that I should be able to paint it as green as it looks 
and like the result. I seldom do. I must be allergic to green. This is leaves old and new, painted last spring when the new green foliage was beginning to compete with the reddish-brown carpet of winter. Sometimes when I am painting outdoors on an exceptionally beautiful day and its essential charm slips through my fingers and escapes, I have a curious feeling that I have been granted a glimpse of a reality finer than anything man has yet set on canvas. The widest opportunity for such a renaissance in realism seems to lie in outdoor figure work, carrying on to new heights the standards set in a great picture like Renoir's Déjeuner de Quinotier in the Phillips Gallery. This type of painting is gradually becoming extinct because the laymen who run our museums and who have assumed the right to set American art standards are backing nothing but the most extreme modernism. We cannot expect young artists to choose the field of traditional painting when they can win large cash prizes by dripping the paint on canvas. This abandoned house is symbolic of the museum image of traditional painting. They regard it as an outworn shell gradually falling into oblivion, and they are doing their best to hurry it along. Personally, I do not think realism is dead. It merely is in a state of shock. But I believe it should be put on the danger list. Here we are again with two paintings which I feel sure you will think are ugly subjects. Why do I persist in showing them to you after telling you that I believed in communication? I did not do these pictures to please you or anyone else. They were exercises done to salve my conscience. You see, I had taught still life painting for years at Carnegie Tech, but I had never painted one. And so, during one summer vacation, I painted three life-sized washstands. And I discovered that I had learned quite a lot in the Warner Still Life class. <coughs> Though they were undertaken as research exercises, I wound up by exhibiting all three, and this black stand is the only one of my works which ever squeezed through the sacrosanct door of New York's Museum of Modern Art. I have selected these slides to show you this evening because I believe that most of you are primarily interested in the pictorial subject. So if you find the subject, shall we say, repulsive, you will not be dis distracted by it and may be willing to dig a little deeper and discover hidden art qualities. Before I switch to the next slide, note the thick earthenware of the pitcher. Now note the difference required in treatment of enamelware, a slicker, sharper edge technique to, su to suggest a sharp metallic ping if you snap it with a finger, not the dull thump of the pitcher on the black stand. Am I going in for sound effects like the movies? No, just trying to follow the high tradition of still life painting where the aim was to use every possible means to suggest the essential character of each object and at the same time to create the illusion of existence in space. To a realist, both of these objectives are art qualities because they put emphasis on certain things in order to convey the most convincing sense of reality. But by a narrow definition, an art quality is something apart from the subject which the painter adds, and I did not neglect these elements either. The areas of light and dark are carefully considered, and in this one I introduced in the color scheme something similar to counterpoint in music, color echoes instead of sound repetition. To oppose the yellow stand, I chose the complementary hue violet, and though it scarcely shows in this slide, there is a faint tinge of this hue in the lighter areas. Stronger echoes of violet are found in the soap and in the bands on the towel. I call this painting Country Life in America, and the humble objects shown, now prized as antiques, were strictly utilitarian when painted, because we were summering in a rented house in very rural New Hampshire. When finished, I proudly put the painting in an improvised frame and started to hang it in what passed for a living room. Take that right back in the washroom where it belongs, said my wife firmly. So I learned early that it was not going to be a popular favorite. However, I had my revenge when some months later I took my wife to the private view of the Associated Artists of Pittsburgh and let her discover that an artist jury had awarded one of the prizes to the ugly duckling. The following summer I had a good time making dozens of sketches of cats, and since the final oil has passed out of my possession, I can only show you the very large pastel which preceded it. Most everyone seems to like cats, so I need not spring to their defense. Now let's journey to Pittsburgh, where I suspect my choice of typical subject matter may not meet the approval of the local Chamber of Commerce. The city fathers are a bit sensitive on the subject of smoke. 
In daily except Sundays, I attempted to convey the sense of motion of an oncoming locomotive by using a series of rapidly changing, superimposed images. You will understand that I was not one of those outraged by Marcel Duchamp's nude descending the staircase. His device for showing movement by multiple images was not new. Years earlier, it had been done by our own A.B. Frost in Scribner's magazine. I never descended a stairway with Duchamp, but I must have descended in the elevator with him many times without suspecting his identity. We had studios in the same New York building. Obviously, this large picture had to be done in the studio from drawings and observation. And one evening I was standing beside the track with my sketch kit slung over my shoulder, just watching and studying the changing effect. Along came a knight of the road who stopped and said, Say, Mac, you can't hop the freight here. You've got to go down by the water tank where the engine stops. I think smoke and steam are often very beautiful, but I was never able to convert Pittsburgh housewife, housewives to my point of view. There is much variety here in form and color, and I take great joy in that little fellow at the right who goes <laughs> and blows smoke rings. The reddish smoke from a Bessemer, is from a Bessemer converter, controlled for more than a quarter of a century by an electric, electronic eye, which cuts it off automatically. Since 1943, I've been urging this method of equalizing the daylight in art galleries, using scanning targets and relays to operate louvers if light proved excessive, or to bring in artificial illumination if more were needed. A year ago, I saw this method in operation at the Capodimonte Museum near Naples. Our engineers are way behind the times in picture lighting. This is Progress and Poverty, one of the rare occasions when the title was decided before I did a stroke of work on the picture. Jones and Laughlin had just completed that new strip mill in the middle distance, and it was said that by automation two men could do the work which used to require a couple of dozen. No improvement in the workers' homes on the hillside was apparent. When Charles Birchfield served as one of the jurors for the Carnegie International Exhibition, I drove him up and down and around on those narrow streets on both sides of the river. He was enchanted because in those days he painted such subjects. He said to me, people say that I paint ugly pictures. I don't see how an artist could paint something he thought was ugly. I showed Monongahela Roundhouse to one of my Westmoreland townsmen and he didn't mind it at all till I mentioned the roundhouse, whereupon he decided that it was an ugly picture because a roundhouse was an ugly thing. It was no use telling him that the curving line of the roof of the roundhouse was one of the significant things that gave dramatic impact to the composition. Now we will break away from Pittsburgh and swing down to Washington and finish our painting and sketching tour there. And this is the Cosmos Club on a winter evening, on one of those evenings when the clouds hang so low that city lights turn them pink. Now perhaps you'd like to step inside and get warm. And the Lafayette Square murals are now far enough back in history so that many do not know of the shortcuts that had to be utilized and the amount of preparatory work that had to be done during the summer in order that the actual execution could proceed rapidly and be complete before the grand opening of the new clubhouse. There is not a single brush stroke on the sky of Jackson Place. The upper part was done with eight inch rulers and the clouds with rollers cut to smaller sizes. All the shades of paint for the murals were mixed and tried out in New Hampshire and sent down to Washington in labeled cans. There's little brushwork on the buildings either. Paint was applied with these flat cellulose sponges which the ladies use in their kitchen sinks. Laborious work on window sashes was avoided by cementing six regular rectangular blocks of rubber on a wooden block. Dip it in paint, smack the wall twice, and you have a 12-pane window to fit many of the buildings. When it was all finished, I called up the Bureau of Standards to ask about material for a protective coating. They mentioned a transparent plastic spray. Is it really good, I asked. Well, we used it to preserve the Declaration of Independence. That's good enough for me, I said. This small oil sketch was made so long ago that I can't remember the spot. Let's give it a good old resounding Washington name and call it Swamp Poodle. This sketching business may have looked so easy that a number of you may be tempted to rush out and buy a kit. 
It is a fine plan, but don't get the idea that with each passing day you will paint faster and more easily. It is exactly the opposite because with growing knowledge you demand more of yourself. Here is the north side of Massachusetts Avenue from the Indonesian Embassy. If you do decide to take up painting, I have a word of advice for the ladies. Take your work seriously, but don't take it hard if you get the distinction. From the very beginning, men students seem to view the present and the future with less concern. Each day is just another step on a long road. They are able to look upon their work as what James Gould Cousins called those forms of defeat which are the only victories obtainable in life. Here we have Massachusetts Avenue looking west, and that is the Cosmos Garden fence on the right. My first formal art study was in, at the Washington Art Students League on 17th Street, and in the mixed classes where all the beginners start, I noticed that the girls were often crushed to the verge of tears by an adverse criticism. This simply won't do. The artist may start out as a sensitive soul he is usually pictured in fiction, but to survive he has to develop the hide of a rhinoceros. <coughs> this is the same view of the homeward bound rush, but it's a little later in the evening. Both for his own peace of mind and the good of his work, the artist has to learn to weigh criticism and to shrug off most of it. In the end, he has to paint his own pictures, and he must have both the courage of his convictions and the courage of his rejections. After I'd spent a year at the Art Students League, I was judged worthy of promotion to the men's life class. And what a difference in the more relaxed atmosphere. The attitude toward work was so well expressed in a motto that some student had chalked high up on the wall that I have remembered it all these years. Its philosophy may be sounder than its grammar, but still in closing, I am going to pass it on to you. The motto was, draw firm and be jolly. Thank you.